I think I want to start off by saying that it's important to recognize that South Africa is a deeply um, unequal country. Um, and of course, many might say, well, you know, the goal obviously cannot be, people cannot be made to be entirely equal. But when the inequality is as deep and across as many areas as you find um, in South Africa, it means that people are trapped in a cycle of deprivation. It means that people are born into circumstances which they are unable to escape in their lifetime. And as a party, as we've highlighted earlier, that deeply believes in providing people with the basic opportunities and capabilities to live a life of their choosing, it means that such a, an environment is completely contrary to everything that we stand for. So that's the principal basis about why we care about this historical legacy of inequality in South Africa. The policy then begins by looking at, well, if we care so deeply about inequality, we need to understand what the key drivers or constituents of inequality are in South Africa. Let's not speak in these vague terms about BE and scorecards and well, what are the specific things that we are looking to address if we want to ensure that we address inequality. And this is not um, something that we have to thumb suck. Um, there's extensive research and studies done on the drivers of inequality um, in South Africa. The, um, the data is there. So we know that it's driven by poverty. Over 55% of South Africans currently live um, in poverty. It's driven by mass unemployment. So 43% of South Africans are unemployed, including those who have been discouraged uh, to look for work. Um, it's driven by factors such as, as well as poor nutrition and poor healthcare, we know one in four children in South Africa are stunted um, before the age of five years old. This has enormous lifelong consequences um, to um, the ability of those individuals, those young children uh, to learn, uh, to become socially integrated individuals, and it also impacts on their economic opportunities later in life. So before the age of five, to some extent, that person's life has been determined as one with lifelong lower chances than anyone else who was able to avoid being stunted by the age of five years old. We also historically have a problem of a broken families. Now, we're not here to prescribe the type of family a unit one should have, but um, the support and stability that a sound family environment provides is equally important. And we know that in part, this does have structural roots back to apartheid that enforced a migratory system of labor that really separated families, et cetera. And we see some of those uh, results still today where um, we know that 43% of children live with um, uh, do not, sorry, 43% of children live only with their biological uh, mother, only 2% of children live only with their biological father, and you actually have 19% of children below the age of four years old, if I'm not mistaken, who live with neither parent, and it, the situation becomes worse um, as they get older. So you have all of these known drivers of inequality, and what does the linchpin or the main um, economic empowerment policy for the country have to say about these areas? Absolutely nothing. You will not find anywhere in BE empowerment policy that addresses or speak to these drivers of an inequality that we have just identified. BE has nothing to offer in terms of how to address poverty. It has nothing to offer in terms of how we should address the um, poor educational outcomes of our education system. It has nothing to say about how we address the breakdown of the family. It has nothing to say about how we improve childhood stunting and don't condemn people to lifelong poor opportunities. There's nothing at all in the central economic empowerment policy of the country that actually speaks to the things which have been identified as the key drivers and constituents of inequality. So first and foremost, if our policy does anything at all, is that it reorientates the focus of economic empowerment policy to the um, drivers of inequality. So you will find a great deal mentioned in our policy about what exactly, well, diagnosing firstly the challenges in each of these areas, and then providing solutions to what we can do to address race, poverty, unemployment, um, inequalities in healthcare, et cetera. Um, I, can't, I don't think in this show I can go through them all, but I think it's very important um, to just have the takeaway message that the first thing that needs to be done is reorientating the focus of empowerment policy away from elite enrichment to the things that will truly lead to broad-based economic inclusion. And those are the very things that form the subject matter of our economic empowerment policy. So, so Gwen, the ANC approach and BEE is to, in essence, create this elite who are often politically connected individuals, and they enjoy benefits almost as proxies for the rest of, of the South African people. 
Um, the DA has come up with its own economic justice policy. Why do you think there is such resistance to a d alternative DA policies when we point to the failure that has brought us to this point? Why are commentators and, and often business folk uh, so resistant to, to any alternative to the existing policy? I think it's a number of reasons. I can't discount one actually just being willful ignorance. There are some people who refuse to understand, even when the answer is as plain as daylight. But aside from, from those reasons, if we look at some of the more, if we take it um, in good faith and look at some of the genuine concerns, I think one of the concerns is that um, is a belief that most Africans want race-based policies and that this would be a difficult sell. I cannot tell you how many times, um, especially in a more sort of educated or a higher income uh, audience, the concern will be, well, that sounds all well and good what you're saying and it sounds like a fantastic policy approach. However, this is not going to fly in South Africa. So people abstracted from themselves. They don't say, well, I agree, and therefore I'm now going to be a champion of this kind of policy elsewhere. They don't see their role as then, well, going out there and persuading people this is the right way um, to move. They then say, actually, there's no way we can sell this to others. So I think, one, if we can actually continue to demonstrate that this is a policy approach that enjoys broad support throughout the um, variety of stakeholders in the country. So if we look at the surveys conducted by the Institute of Race Relations, and also there's a survey that's done by the Institute of Justice and Reconciliation, these kind of surveys that are carried out continuously show that most Africans do not support uh, race-based policies as an approach to um, transformation. And I can understand why, because clearly your race does not change no matter how empowered you become. So it's this massive lacuna that opens up the opportunity for um, the politically um, 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 connected for um, economic elites to benefit on behalf of poorest Africans purely on the basis of their shared skin color. So I think most Africans recognize that BE has not helped them. Um, and you see that when you ask the Africans, has BE benefited you personally? Has BE benefited anyone you know in your community? The answers are overwhelmingly that no, it hasn't. Most people cannot identify how they personally have been assisted. And this is not just anecdotal. We don't have to only rely on what people say in surveys and focus groups, because I know people will say, well, there's always these um, challenges and how a survey is structured and how the question is asked. But let's move away from the technicalities of surveying and, and focus groups. The data that I presented earlier about the numbers, certainly the numbers don't lie. It doesn't take a rocket science to know that if your central economic empowerment policy um, has been in place for as long as it has in South Africa, and yet your poverty levels um, are as high as they are, your unemployment levels are as high as they are, your educational outcomes are as low um, as they are, the numbers don't lie. So even without talking to people, we know that this policy approach does not work, and people are aware that it does not work. So I think if we can get behind the fact that this is not something we actually need to convince most um, ordinary South Africans about, this is really an issue that um, those who are in a position of influence, thought leaders or the public intelligentsia, however you want to call it, but those who are in a capacity where they talk to others, where they influence others, um, that it's really that group or cohort that has to get on board and who has to be educated about the real levels of support. Um, of such a policy approach. And I think they're wrong about um, attitudes of most Africans when it comes to non-racial policy.